Hey guys, it's Carter. Some of the most common emergencies that we see in the emergency department and in EMS are emergencies that involve the heart or the lungs. And to understand how these two body systems work together to sustain life, we need to be able to understand how blood flows from the heart into the lungs, back to the heart, and then out systemically where it perfuses tissues and then eventually makes its way back to the heart so it can be sent to the lungs and reoxygenated again. A good understanding of this blood flow is foundational to future understandings of cardiovascular and pulmonary pathologies because these two systems work so closely together. So in this lesson, we're going to go through concept mapping blood flow from the heart and to the lungs and then out systemically. My hope with this lesson is that you'll be able to have a good understanding of how blood flows so that as we get into some of these more complex discussions about pathophysiology and patient management, uh, you'll have a good anatomical and physiological understanding of how these systems work. So this is the concept map that we're going to be working with to understand how blood moves from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart, and then out systemically where it eventually returns to the heart via the venous system. I want to make something really clear before we get started, though. This is not intended to be a picture-perfect anatomic model of the human body. This is instead supposed to be a concept map. And by that, I mean it's supposed to help us understand conceptually how this blood is moving, but it's not really going to do that in a way that's 100% anatomically correct. After we complete this slide and we go through this concept map, we're actually going to take a look at some anatomic models and be able to see how this really works its way out in the human body. So let's get started. The first thing that we need to do is label our heart. So in our heart, we have the right atrium and the left atrium, and we have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The right side of the heart is the heart is the side of the heart that's primarily responsible for pulmonary blood flow. And the left side of the heart is the side of the heart that's responsible for systemic blood flow, blood flow out to the rest of the body. Now in the heart, we also have some valves. And these valves are responsible for preventing backflow. Essentially, when the heart squeezes, if the heart was just squeezing without valves, blood would indiscriminately flow forward and backward and it would really just flow in the path of least resistance, which would probably be backwards, not forwards. So we have some valves in the heart that help ensure that blood is flowing in one direction. We have four basic valves that you'll need to know. So let's take a look at these in detail. The first valve that we're gonna talk about is called the tricuspid valve. The, the tricuspid valve. And the tricuspid valve is three cusps, and it sits between the right atrium and the right ventricle. That valve prevents blood backflow between the right ventricle and right atrium. We also have what's called the pulmonary valve. And the pulmonary valve sits between the pulmonary artery and the right ventricle. Now, between the left atria and the left ventricle, we have the mitral valve and the valve that's preventing backflow from the aorta back into the left ventricle is what's called the aortic valve. Now, there is a semi-inappropriate mnemonic that I've always learned or I've used to memorize this. This was taught to, be my, taught to me by my first EMT instructors, very first time I was a baby healthcare provider and going through EMT school. And the way they taught it to me was TPMA. So here we have tricuspid T, pulmonary P, mitral M, and A for aortic, TPMA, toilet paper on my ass. However you remember them, you just need to make sure that you know where they sit in the heart and their roles because you'll have patients that the provider discusses with you and that patient may have some mitral valve regurgitation. You need to be able to picture that valve in the heart and then be able to think of how that might affect blood flow through the rest of the heart and ultimately through the rest of the body.
Now that we have our heart valves labeled, let's zoom back out again to this bigger picture so that we can trace blood flow. In the human body, blood returns to the heart via veins and leaves the heart via arteries. That's going to become an important distinction to remember in just a minute. But let's talk. So from systemic circulation, and by systemic circulation, I mean circulation in the rest of the body, blood returns to the heart via a blood vessel called the vena cava and enters the right atria of the heart. From the right atria, the blood is then pumped into the right ventricle, where blood is then pumped out to the lungs via an artery called the pulmonary artery. Now remember, just a second ago, I told you that veins return blood to the heart and arteries carry blood away from the heart. Here, we have the only artery in the body that regularly carries deoxygenated blood. It's the pulmonary artery. Most of you have probably learned that arteries carry oxygenated blood and veins carry deoxygenated blood. And while that's generally true, it is not true for this part of the body. Here, the pulmonary artery is carrying blood away from the heart to the lungs, but it's deoxygenated blood. Now, there are some actual structural differences in the tissues of arteries and veins, but for our purposes here, you really just need to remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood to the heart. Now, from the lungs, we have the only vein that carries oxygenated blood. And that vein takes the blood back to the left atrium. And that vein is called the pulmonary vein. And this is the only blood vessel in the body, or the only vein in the body, that regularly carries oxygenated blood. Now, as oxygenated blood is returned to the heart via the pulmonary vein, it enters the left atrium, passes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, where it's then ejected past the aortic valve and out systemically to the rest of the body via a blood vessel known as the aorta. The aorta is a fairly large blood vessel that then carries blood systemically. So this is a basic concept map of how blood is pumped from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart, and then out systemically to the rest of our bodies and the rest of the tissues that need that oxygenated blood. I'd review this slide a few times and make sure that you can actually draw out this diagram and that you really understand how this blood flow occurs. Because if you're not able to grasp how this blood flow is occurring through the heart and the lungs, you're really going to struggle when it comes to discussing pathologies of the heart or pathologies of the lungs. Once you have this down, go ahead and continue the lecture and we'll actually look at some anatomic models of how this really occurs in the body. But please don't continue with the lecture until you have a solid understanding of this slide right here. The next slides are going to be more complicated because the human body isn't this cleanly laid out for you. So once you're ready, let's look at some models. Now that we understand how blood flows through the cardiovascular and pulmonary systems, let's look at a more anatomically correct model of a heart. Blood returns to the heart via the vena cava, and that structure is represented here. Now what we didn't represent in our concept map is that the vena cava has a superior branch and an inferior branch. And as you might suspect, the inferior vena cava is collecting blood from the lower body, while the superior vena cava is collecting blood from the head. From the vena cava, blood enters the right atria, where it then passes through the tricuspid valve. Remember T, P, M, A. Blood passes through the tricuspid valve and enters the right ventricle, where it's then pumped by the right ventricle 
up and out into the left and right pulmonary arteries. Look at these arteries in greater detail in a minute on the next slide. But from here, remember, blood is pumped out via the ar pulmonary arteries. There's a left branch and a right branch because you have a left lung and a right lung. It's pumped out into the lungs and then is returned via the pulmonary veins. And you can see them tucked back here. Now, the heart does not sit straight up and down in the chest. Instead, the heart is really leaning forward and is resting on its right-hand side. So what you see here is the right side of the heart is more prominent in a picture of the heart where we're looking straight on as though the patient was standing and facing you or was in the anatomic position. So, because of the way that the heart is leaning forward and on its right-hand side, that left atrial structure is somewhat obstructed and hard to see. And those right pulmonary veins and the left pulmonary veins kind of tuck in behind the heart and run behind the heart to get to that left atria. Now, from the left atria, blood passes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then is ejected out past the aortic valve through the aorta and then out systemically. Now, in the aortic arch, you actually see these three branches that immediately branch off at the top of the arch. This branch here feeds the right carotid artery, and then before it actually reaches up to the carotid, there's a little branch that goes off and is the right subclavian artery that feeds the right upper extremity. Here we see the left carotid artery, and then tucked back in here is the left subclavian artery that feeds the left upper extremity. The descending aorta pops out down here and runs posterior to the myocardium, and that descending aorta feeds the rest of the body, essentially, with oxygenated blood. Just a couple things I'd like to point out here. You'll notice that the muscle of the left ventricle is much thicker and bigger than the muscle of the right ventricle. And that's because the distance that the right ventricle has to push blood is much shorter than the distance the left ventricle has to push blood. If you see here, remember this right ventricle is pumping out to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries, and the lungs really aren't that far away. They're actually just sitting right here in the chest. So they're not pumping blood but a few centimeters. Whereas the left ventricle of the heart is pumping blood systemically. It's, it has to push blood hard enough to get it all the way up the carotids and into the brain, as well as all the way down to your toes and to the extremities. So the left ventricle has much higher pressures to push against and is therefore a bigger and more muscular part of the heart. A couple other important things that are worth noting here. You'll see that there are these pieces of heart muscle that connect to what are called the chorae tendinae. These chorae tendinae connect to the heart valves and are responsible for manipulating the heart valve during contraction. These papillary muscles are actually part of the myocardium. They are heart muscle and they can actually be injured by heart attacks. There are cases in which the papillary muscles can rupture in a heart attack or following a heart attack, and it can cause big problems for people because once those muscles rupture, there's nothing to actuate those heart valves. And as we discussed, the heart valves are responsible for making sure that blood flows in the right direction. So if we completely lose the ability to manipulate these valves, we would potentially lose our ability to produce effective forward blood flow. There's a couple other layers of tissue I want to discuss as well. The outermost layer of the heart is the epicardium. This is a serous membrane that really serves as the last layer of protection before we get into the myocardium, which is the actual muscle of the heart. And then lining each of the ventricles and atria is the endocardium. I'll give you a real-life clinical connection for why understanding this anatomy is important. A complication of using unsterile technique to start IVs or to access IV ports is called infective endocarditis.
Now, if you think about this for a second, endocardium is the innermost layer of the heart, and itis refers to inflammation. So endocarditis is actually inflammation of this inner wall of the heart, and infective endocarditis is endocarditis caused by an infective process, like bacteria that can enter the bloodstream, find their way into the heart, and then attach themselves on the inside of the heart. Infective endocarditis is actually very difficult to treat because there's so much blood flow through the heart. Even when we give IV antibiotics, those antibiotics really don't have any time to dwell and get to that bacteria. So infective endocarditis can be fatal for patients. It's extremely difficult to treat and can have really long-term lasting complications because it can affect this endocardium and cause scarring and other complications that limit the ability of the heart to pump effectively. Now that we've talked about the heart, let's go on and look at the anatomy of the lungs and the heart and how they kind of sit together and share this space in the thorax. Okay, so here we have an anatomic model of the lungs, the diaphragm, the left and right bronchus, and the trachea, as well as the larynx, so basically the entire lower airway. And over here we have a picture, an older picture, of the heart. Now you'll notice here that there's actually a space, the left lung is smaller than the right lung. The left lung actually only has two lobes, where the right lung has three. And that's because, remember, the heart sits leaning forward on its right-hand side. And so if you envision how that sits in the chest, the heart actually kind of fits and tucks itself in right here in the chest. So we'll actually take this, and you can see how it kind of tucks itself in and fits right there inside of the chest. One important just landmark, or I guess piece to keep in mind, is that the trachea and the left and right bronchus run posterior to the myocardial structures and the aorta. So this trachea is actually sitting behind the heart, and the heart is sitting in front of that. Now, to get a better idea of pulmonary blood flow, what I'd like to do is look at a posterior view of the lungs. So we're going to be looking, we're going to flip this patient around and look at them as though we're looking at their back. Here we are. So here we have the lungs and they're flipped around as though we are looking at them from the back of the patient. And you can see back here, this is the, we see the pulmonary vein returning. So this would be what structure? It would be the left atrium. And then down here we have this big meaty left ventricle. And you can see how complex this is with this string of blood vessels where we have the pulmonary artery, which is coming off the right ventricle, going out to the lungs, and then eventually reaching the alveoli and the capillary beds where gas exchange occurs, and then returning via the pulmonary vein. Remember, the pulmonary vein is returning oxygenated blood to the left atria, down the left ventricle, and then out the aorta systemically. Okay, so this picture over here is still a um, anterior view of the heart, as though we were looking straight on at a person who's facing us in the anatomic position. This is a posterior view, where we can actually see how the trachea and then the left and right bronchus run behind the heart with all of these other vascular structures like the aorta, and the vena cava, both the inferior and superior vena cava, kind of wrapping themselves around so we can pump a relatively high volume of blood through what is really a relatively small space in the body. Now, one other thing I just want to point out with the aorta here, they have the aorta cut right here so that way we can see kind of the rest of these structures. But if we were to have continued to draw the aorta, it would actually bend down and run into the abdomen and supply blood to the rest of the body. I hope you found this short lecture helpful. I've really used that concept map for myself and learning what is really a complex area of anatomy. You know, in EMS and emergency medicine, I'd say probably the two most common complaints we see relate to the heart or relate to the lungs. And so because of that, all healthcare providers who work in emergency medicine need to have a solid understanding of this area of anatomy.
If you have any questions or thoughts or comments, please feel free to reach out to me and send me a message.